every entrepreneur has a story. Welcome to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur, where each episode, your host, Brian Carney, will share a drink with a successful business owner and have them discuss their unique journey, gaining insight on what it takes to be an entrepreneur and the different ways to get there. Brian isn't just a beer nerd, he's also the co-founder of Rivers Edge Advisors, a financial planning firm headquartered in Delaware, specializing in working with business owners. It's time to pour yourself a drink and enjoy a happy half hour with an entrepreneur. Hey everyone, welcome to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Brian Carney. Our guest today is Robert Herrera. Rob worked as an architect for a prestigious New York City firm and as an early contributor to WeWork before he moved back to Delaware to start his business, The Mill. The Mill is a co-working space located in Wilmington, Delaware. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. So for our conversation, we're recording this in the fall. So I'm going to be trying a pumpkin at Lancaster uh, Brewing Company, Baked Pumpkin Ale. Now I have to make a confession about pumpkin beer. About five years ago, my family went on an October trip to the Outer Banks and we brought like four cases of nothing but pumpkin beer. So I've OD'd on it a little bit. So we're going to see yeah, how this yeah. goes. You know how that is. But so what are yeah. you what are you going to be drinking today? So I love to rep Dogfish Head whenever I can. And this was, I have not had this before. This is my first time called Costumes and Karaoke. Oh, I love it. It's, it's got a lot going on with the, with the cover. You can see the cover of the bottle. Oh, yeah, it's great. And all you always do the covers things. great. I always love the, uh, the labels they put to put out. Their artwork's phenomenal. It really yeah. is. Um, well, we're definitely going to be talking about them in a little bit. But uh, so first, let, why don't we start? Tell us a little bit about your business. Yeah, so um, co-working something that, that, that I am crazy enough. And I, I, I would say I've had a front row seat to the sort of genesis of it and to where it is today. And it's, it's had so many up and downs and, and a lot of misconceptions and a lot of interesting stories around it, given the history of WeWork. Yeah. But um, co-working is, is essentially just to oversimplify it, a shared workspace, mm-hmm. but co-working adds that community aspect to it um, where there's shared amenities across office. And it's kind of reinventing the way we think about office space in my yeah. mind. That's what co-working is. Yeah, yeah for sure. So, so you have this great job in New York City working at an architectural firm. And um, what made you decide to, to leave that, move back to Delaware and start this business? Well, there was a lot, like so many things, there was a lot of factors that um, that led up to that. So, so I worked for this firm, Perkins Eastman in New York, and that really was, to, and if you ask my, my mother this, since I was 10 years old, I always wanted to be an architect. So oh, that really? Was, that was my thing, man. I, I was working at a very prestigious law firm. Perkins Eastman at the time was the largest in Manhattan. And I, I had, a, to touch on that briefly, it's very rare that a guy without gray hair gets to run projects. Yeah, And um, I, I had somehow weaseled my way into doing a lot of really cool jobs from <laughs> a project called 205 Water Street. We did a little bit of details on that. It's one of my favorite projects I ever got to touch on lightly. And then I got to do a project 160 Leroy Street, which is, if you remember Studio 54, uh-huh. Ian, Schreger, Ian Schreger started that and then became this developer type guy. And I got to work closely with him. And so I had this crazy background and then I got to meet the WeWork guys, which, yeah. which gets into the story of where we go from here. And the only reason why I was invited to that meeting is because, again, guys with gray hair decided they wanted somebody young in the room with these young entrepreneurs who were starting WeWork. Makes sense. So, so I, I'm Miguel McKelvey and Adam Newman, and they at the time, we're not very big and we, we were doing a lot of jobs with all different sized companies and they came in and they assured us they would be the biggest client we've ever had. And we just huh. put that confidence. It was such a fascinating, bizarre meeting. And um, that's how it got started. So I started doing projects with WeWork and um, somewhere in that realm. And I know this is a roundabout story, but I think it leads me. I caught the entrepreneurial bug, right? Yeah. So, so I moved my office into a WeWork space. I, my team grew from me doing it on the side to lo and behold, WeWork blew up to me and like a team of 15 to 20 of us doing that wow. with WeWork. And we kind of built the formulas from the, some of the glass standards with we, WeWork had an internal team and we were like the New York City team just doing rollouts for them. And 
really got a good feel of the business model, but also more than anything, the feel of the culture and sort of the craziness of it. So my perspective of what a startup was was a little warped because we worked as a crazy culture and there's all kinds of things there. I've seen the documentary. But, yeah, the documentary is <laughs> crazy. We, we could touch on that a little bit. There was some, there were some things that I, I didn't agree with that it, it kind of took a weird turn with. But, um, but anyway, it was a fascinating, it, there was the one thing that, that I will say is it's like entrepreneurial sort of bug that we were changing the world and that, you know, startups, there was this feel good kind of vibe around it. And there was, you could do no better than start a company was kind of the vibe, right? Yeah. So kind of living and breathing that culture every day, you can't not catch that bug. Sure. Very contagious. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Right. And so you do that and then you, and then you throw in, I just had my first son. Um, right around the time that, and my wife wanted to move back to Delaware. So, so we, we made the leap. He had some health issues. We took him into Morris hospital, which I can't say enough about. And in that time frame, I made the decision to, to make the leap to move back to Wilmington. Wow. So I had this home office. I had a couple ideas. I talked to a few developers and then uh, I got to know Chris Puccini. Okay. Crazy enough. And this is a roundabout story. I, I did a hotel and this is a stretch with a guy named Andres Pastorizo, who is a dear friend of mine. He happens to be Chris Puccini's cousin. Okay. And, and he wrote him a note and said, this kid's like building WeWorks all over the country out of Delaware in this like one room. And he manages a team of like 20 people and he wants to build a co-work space in Wilmington. And then the, the rest was history. We went and had lunch. And I would say within like four months of that lunch meeting, we, we were building the mill. That's amazing. So it just happened so crazy fast. So there's a lot to unpack there. So let, let's kind yeah, of, sorry, let's, no, 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 that, that's, su it's so interesting. So let me just get this straight. So you have a young son who has health issues. And if yeah. I, if, you know, from, from some of the re reading that I did, your wife was pregnant with twins. Yeah. Yeah. And you decided to leave this great job to start a business out of a home office. Am I, did I get that part right? Sort of, yeah. So, so I was doing a lot of work for my old firm from my home. I was doing, I was free. I was like a contract employee with my old firm. because they didn't want, they didn't want to lose the whole WeWork connection. Mm -hmm. And they were quite frankly, they were worried I was going to take WeWork on as a client alone, ah. and, which is a typical architecture to architect thing to do. Yeah. And I just didn't have any interest in doing that. I was very close with my former boss and we are close to this day. And I just didn't want to do that route. I just thought it would be more fun to try this entrepreneurial thing out and start my own business. That's awesome. Now, yeah. th th looking at the Delaware office scene when you came on, commercial real estate scene, when you when you decide that you want to do a co-working space, there's no co-working space five years ago in Delaware, in the entire state, likely, right? Yeah, there, there was a place called Coin Lofts, and I actually worked out of there for a, minute, for a bit. Okay. And they, you know, hats off to them, they were... They started, yeah, I want to give them a shout out. It was, it was a guy named Steven who's become a good friend. And uh, what was the other guy? Wes, Steven Wes. So anyway, these, these guys are really ahead of their time. They kind of started CoinLoft back when we were starting. Oh, wow. So okay. Kind of yeah. And they were a group of uh, coders. Steve Rutger was his name. And they were, they're phenomenal coders. They're still around Delaware today. And they had this tech vibe. And they were down on Market Street. And they just built this really cool little vibe. Yeah, that we we built on. I worked out there myself, got to know everybody, and very friendly. They kind of like passed the baton on to me. Wow. Um, at the same time, there was a, something called Thirteen Thirteen Innovation at the Hercules Building. Yeah. But they were just small in scale, and so I I had come from a different realm where where we studied the way people interacted in a business space religiously. Where these are these were more tech focused guys that wanted just that community aspect. Yeah. And I kind of brought the real estate know how and the constructability and the sort of like standards of things that we learned at WeWork. That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Delaware office scene is pretty, it's like your typical law office. Yeah. You know, that's sort of when you think about what, what you were walking into and to sort of say like, hey, that's not what we're doing. We're doing this a little bit differently. Did people think you were crazy? Oh, absolutely. I, I was told by more than one individual, and I won't throw those names out that, that, <laughs> that that it was a bad, it wasn't a good idea. The 1313 and coin lofts were not in financially strong positions. Um, they told me I should be a nonprofit and try to fundraise. And, and basically it's, it's tough when you're, when you're going to quit your job and try this out. 
to have some of the the naysayers, but I feel like you're not a true startup if you don't have a little bit of that, right? Totally agree. Yep. So, so, so they did they didn't quite get the vision I was trying to paint, but that that was all right. We worked we worked past that, but it did make it nerve wracking, right? Sure. You do start. There were t- so many times when I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah, maybe these guys are right. Maybe these guys are right. Maybe they don't. And and then also one thing to put in context that was right around the time of the Dow Dupont merger. Okay. The Delaware office space was just not like. The price per square foot was going way down. People were not into leasing space in downtown Wilmington in particular. Yeah. So everything was lining up as if Delaware was going to be on this big decline. Right. That was sure. kind of the vibe. If, if you remember that when DuPont was shifting out and we're, we're a state, let alone a city, let alone a town that has been based on this chemical company. And with that sort of transition, it was weird. Everybody L- literally for generations. For generations. Yeah. And, and with all that going on in the background too, was, was there, there was so many questions that were that were circulating. And part of that was inspiration why I named it the mill, because I, I saw this as sort of the next phase of innovation. Like DuPont has had such a strong history and I want to tip my hat to that. Yeah, like like a little, uh, you know, sort of ode to, or a nod to uh, the, to Hagley, that sort of a thing. Yeah, to the Lutheri- Lutherian mill, Mills, I always mispronounce that, but yeah. And, and Hagley's been a great partner in all of this. We still have patent models in our lobby to this day. Oh, that's so cool. There's, there's only two companies that, that lease these uh, patent models from Hagley, myself at the mill and Walt Disney Company. Oh, really? So, like, that's, a, that's pretty cool. That's a cool thing to, to, uh, to bring up. Super cool. So I love to tell that story. Bob Iger, when he was reigning over Walt Disney, uh, wanted to display American patent models at the Shanghai Walt Disney in Asia, which I think is like, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Bob Iger. And I think, just think about the courage it takes to make that statement. Yeah, so, for sure. That's great. Yeah. So, so you, you come up with this idea and, and, and you become by chance. So for those of you who aren't from Delaware that listen, Delaware literally is the six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon in real life. Like, you know, we, the first time you meet someone from Delaware, within two minutes, you go, where'd you go to high school? Do you know this person? Boom, you have a connection in common. And it usually is faster than that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, so you have a friend that has a relationship with Chris Puccini, who was one of the, you know, sort of the, the big and up and coming developers um, five years ago. Now they are humongous and have done everything. Maybe, you know, to say up and coming five years ago is a little bit late. But anyway, so yeah. you meet Chris and you, so Chris... How does that take uh, the mill to the next step? Yeah, I mean, when I think about it, I, I was 29. I was 29 years old. And Chris had a lot of pushing questions. And, and keep in mind, I was, I was an architect, right? Not a business owner. Sure, yeah. He had so many questions about the business model. And uh, it kind of made me think through that as well. But he, he's a brilliant guy to work with. And it, it's hard to describe when you, he's a real entrepreneur, like he's a real, like this guy loves to take risk. Yeah. He, 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 the way he approaches a problem, I've learned so much. I've had a front row seat of how the last five years of Bucini Pong Group, and it's been an honor to do so, but like he was so entrepreneurial and he had so many press. I just remember being just, he had such a barrage of questions that I was not prepared for. Yeah. But at the same time, at the same time, I sort of circled it up and then came back with a bunch of answers. And I think he appreciated that. Sure. And uh, the rest is history. I think we were fast friends and it was not so much if we were going to do this, it started to become when. Yeah. And he was just go, go. like he, he wanted, like as soon as he latched on, this was going to be, this was going to be a thing here in Wilmington. Uh, it, it was go, go, go. Like that's why it just happened quickly after that. It was, before long, I was laying out the space and, and talking to contractors and bidding out the job. Like it didn't, wow. it felt like the what four months went by like this. It was really cool. We were launching this thing. It was pretty wild. That's amazing. So yeah. uh, is it fair to say that he sort of was like a mentor to you? Oh, without, without question. And even without, without question, um, I've learned so much. Like, I feel like I got the the cliff notes on how to start a company through these guys who, who've done it the wrong way, the right way and every, everywhere in between. Sure. Yeah. Businesses and to sort of have their insight. I, I go to them for advice. I, I do a lot of real estate development on my separately now on my own. And, and they've been such friends throughout that process, like talking me through historic tax credits and 
new market tax credits and even just high level finance. I'm not a finance guy. Again, I'm an architect, but I, I just pretend to be one now. But I go to Chris for all sorts of advice. Yeah. I'm sure he gets tired of it, but he he's an open, he's been a, he's really been an open book to me. And I feel like any successful entrepreneur needs that. I don't know any that have done anything in a bubble. For sure. What, no. what, do you, what do you think he saw in you or your idea that made him say like, hey, this is a great idea. And, and you know, I feel like those two things have to be married to get the support of someone like that, especially in, in the world that, you're, that you live in. Yeah, I think it was a little, it, that's, a great, that's a great question. I, you know, I think it's a little bit of crazy on Chris's part. I'm like, what were you thinking, man? I would never give a 29 year old <laughs> that big of an investment to build something like this. Right. Um, but he really was into co-working. He, he had tried to talk to WeWork in the past and with no, with no success. And sort of my crazy WeWork stories, he was fascinated to hear where I started and what we were up to and like the different projects I had worked on. But, but the other thing too, an, another lesson in all of this, and I only worked for his, with his cousin, who was a senior partner at this law, the architecture firm that I mentioned briefly on one job and I wasn't happy to do it. I remember this. I remember I had a really great project that I was working on. It was a residential job in, in Brooklyn that I was excited to do. And I got assigned to go work on this other project. And I stayed late hours and worked so hard on this project that again, I didn't want to do. Yeah. And fast forward a few years later, this guy gave me one of the best referrals of all time to Chris, you know, and, and not only he went on and on about my work ethic and how crazy I am and how many hours I put in. And, and wow. And it, and it goes, I was very close to not doing, to not doing that. I really didn't want to do that project. Yeah. But it goes to show that like those little details matter and following through on projects that you don't think are going to be worthwhile to you. Yeah. It was such a lesson that for me. So like, even on the smallest projects I've taken that and I follow, I really do what I can to follow through on them. Yeah. So if you didn't attack that job that you hated the way that you yeah. did, you, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation right exactly. now. Exactly. Like that's one, that's one moment in time I can point at and, and Andres to this day, he stayed in t- another great mentor throughout all this, but he he comes and visits me pretty regularly here in Wilmington. And that's, it's just in all, he's like, holy cow, how did that, how did this all happen? You know? Yeah, that's so crazy. That you know, you kind of think about uh, those little um, th- those little instances in your life where that literally changed the trajectory of your life. And at the time you didn't know it, you were probably, you know bitching and complaining that you were doing a job that you didn't want and then fast forward a few years and now this is that's pretty amazing yeah yeah and so, and, it, and also chris had called uh s9 my uh, an architecture firm my boss siddle patel is another mentor i've had so many i've been blessed with if this is a lesson in anything i've been blessed with wonderful mentors yeah and uh siddle same thing gave a just was like this i'm very upset you're taking my guy kind of thing because this guy's the best that was basically the recommendation that's awesome. So from there, I think that convinced, I think Chris got, you know, some of the butterflies he was having went away after he talked to me yeah. from, from past experiences of mine. You know, that's, that's kind of interesting because I feel like a lot of industries aren't so collegial in the sense, like my industry is terrible with that. You yeah. know, like, I, you know, you go say, Hey, I want to take your guy. They're like, you know, F you, there's no way you're taking him. This is, you know, very territorial, not sort of like, yeah, I could see he's outgrown this place. You should be moving on. So that's a pretty amazing thing about your industry in general. Yeah, it's not always like that. I think I I was I was blessed in in a, in a unique position to have those few people that did that for me. That's good because uh, it, it can be very. There are I've heard stories of other territorial S firms, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I don't want to say that holistically, but I, I was blessed with wonderful mentors and and all those people that I mentioned. I stay in touch with probably annoyingly so on their behalf. <laughs> time and ask random code questions to Siddle or random finance questions to Chris. And I, you know, I don't know what I would do without them. Yeah. Well, I want, I want to go back to, to your time at WeWork. So is there a time, you know, you, you're sort of drinking from this fire hose from, of that, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, you know, I, if you haven't seen the WeWork documentary about Adam Newman, right? Is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you you definitely get that vibe that that they were the vibe that they were trying to 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 push there was totally different and so you you know you're sort of drinking from this entrepreneurial fire hose from this guy was there a time that you can point to that you go all right I want to do my own thing is there a singular time you could point to oh that's tough I, I think it, it it sort of culminated there there. There was a point 
and this is gonna this is gonna sound terrible. There was a there was a few points throughout the process where I'm like, these guys, these guys are this are, are crushing it this much. Like, because right. <laughs> when, when you really and, when, and the reality is, I, I've been involved in a hand, I've been blessed to work on a lot of high profile projects and work with other companies and other business owners. And when you get under the hood of anything, they, we're all just human, right? For and sure. that was that was kind of the the big thing for me, like the like. These guys are just doing the best they can with what they've got. There was no mercurial, like special thing. Like when you really, Adam was just a guy. Like people try to put him on a pedestal. When you get close to that, you realize that even we, we met, I got to meet a lot of big time developers throughout New York, which has given me a lot of confidence through that WeWork connection. And I think it was sort of culminating. My confidence grew throughout that where I'm like, these are just guys trying to problem solve. And, and really having skills and experience, there's nothing that can replace that. But but having the right mentality to work through problems and issues and sticking with it and going through is all you need to be yeah. successful. It's, it's very simple, right? And, and when you see these guys that are wildly successful and you get to look under the hood of what really goes on and how it really operates, my confidence just continued to grow. So I couldn't point to a single moment. It just kept going. And I'm like, I, you know, I think I can do this. Um, that and along with it, just the energy levels, like the, 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 again, when I talked about how infectious the culture was, when I, when I sat and worked out of a WeWork for a little while, it was just so addicting, the culture and the, the like wanting to create something out. My passion quickly changed from architecture, which I wanted to do my whole life, to, to wanting to be my own business owner because they worship that. Yeah. And how that happened, it was, it was kind of gradual, I would say. Sure. And where and when that happened, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it just sort of slowly happened over time where I'm like just this different being now. I, I my wife talks about that transformation because she kind of saw it in real time where a lot of things changed and how I've acted and approached different problems, you know? Yeah, that's a pretty good Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the confidence growing thing is I, I've come to this realization, you know, I've been in the workforce for 20 years. I, I, I sort of come to the realization that just about everyone is, co- is still figuring it out to some extent, you know? It, oh, it's, it's sort of like, I'm going to make a weird analogy. It's sort of like being a parent. Right. You have your first kid and they hand you a baby. You go, I have like, I remember I, the, the nurse had to teach me how to change a diaper. Right. Yeah, in the yeah. hospital. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, I got it. I'm taking her home. Like, this is That's terrifying. Yeah. I don't know what to do. And then yeah. as you start dealing with it more and more. And then by the time, you know, you have three, I have three kids. By the time you get the third one, you're like, oh, this is not a big deal. You're just it's I just all a confidence thing. Yeah. 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 And then as they get older, you're figuring out those new problems. And then you get to a point where, you know, you've got it quote unquote figured out until you have to figure something else out. Right, right, right. And in that same context, and this is kind of an offshoot thing, but something I I teach my staff and I live by, like asking questions with confidence was probably the biggest skill that I learned in that phase. Because it was so, it was go, 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 go. There's no room for pretending like you knew something when you didn't. There's no time for that. So yeah. I got really good at, at being like, I need to know this, this, and this, like, and being very clear, like, I don't understand it. Explain this to me. Succinctly. And when you, when, succinctly and yeah. saying what you don't know, but also driving forward until you can figure it out. Yeah. That was the way I learned from WeWork because these guys were just stumbling through stuff. Like, and, and the documentary didn't capture that, but they were a little bit of that, but they were young guys that Adam didn't finish high school. Like, right. And he, you know, like if you put all that in context, he just, he just attacked things with such vigor that he just figured it out. Yeah. And that's when the culture wore off to a degree. Um, yeah. Where, yeah. I, I find myself these days, I need to slow down with that, but I still jump into things that I have no business doing. But I just think you figure it out and you ask questions and you keep moving. Exactly. You know what I mean? yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I do yeah. think there's this perception that when you're starting out in a career, that you should be able to answer every question that someone asks you. And it took me similarly to you. It took me a little while to realize that, you know, if someone asks you a question, you don't know. If you say, I don't know, no one cares. Right. You just right. go, can you just get me the answer at some point soon? Okay. You yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you definitely get yourself into trouble when you try to fake that you do know it. So, um, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you spent your career, uh, your business is in the, in the shared working space. Um, is it, the point that like now we work is like the Kleenex brand of shared office space. Has it become that? I, I would say so. And I, I would say the other people that, that are worth keeping an eye for is there's a group called Industrious that I think will, will catch them in terms of brand recognition. 
but yeah, WeWork is the brand and yeah. they just, they got somewhat of a success. Like they were able to get through their public offering. I think that was two or three weeks ago. And I think that they're going to be a figure to stay. Yeah. I think they're going to be around. For, they're going to be around for a while. They're going to go through a couple massive restructuring. Yeah. Uh, reorganizing efforts. But I, I think that they're going to be around for a while. Well, the, the thing that I notice about, you know, the, I've been to a, a few WeWorks, but the th- I've been to the mill. The yeah. thing about the mill, and I'm going to use a very technical architectural term, the yeah. really it's really cool on the inside, <laughs> right? You know, you walk in, it's super, it's just really awesome. You know, it's like a great vibe that's going on, you know, the, the, so how have you, the traditional office space is just sterile, you know? Right you've really transformed that. How have you, you know, obviously your architectural background comes into play, but how have you been able to do that successfully? Uh, yeah. So I would say my, my, my biggest um, breakthrough, and I think it's good to step back and walk through the evolution from the design side of. Perfect. Of yeah. And, and when we were first there, it was just open desks to be super clear. It was just desks. And um, what they did, with such great success was interview and constantly ask what people wanted. And then my little team that I managed became the office space specialist in so many ways. I'll forget about we were. Yeah. We became, we just became our whole huge firm. We were a group of young guys. We actually had a team of 20 and I would say it was 50, 50 guys and girls. We were a group of young, it was group. We were super young. I'd say all of us were in our thirties or younger. Yeah. It was odd in the architecture profession. And we just constantly did client questionnaires and we always asked what was going on. What, what do you like? What do you not like? And we started learning things because we were trying to reinvent something. You can't, again, dive into something. We weren't trying to replicate some office standards. We were trying, and the er, open desk issues were acoustics. So people didn't like that, that you and I are having a conversation right now. And then everybody in this big room, we're going to, we're going to hear you. Great That's point. something that when lofts here had that, that issue it was just a wide open space. So, so we started tackling that and we did glass offices. Well, glass offices worked in glass conference rooms for private meetings. That sounds simple, like we should have known that. Uh, but we were also managing budgets and how do we do those costs effectively? Well, a lot of research went into that. Right. So we put glass up, but then we got these fishbowl effects and people didn't like that people could look you in the eye and not be talking to you though, like just distractingly. Yeah. So we started putting privacy film up. So we put privacy film from like floor to ceiling and the problem that sound that was great from those sex people like their offices natural light would still come through the problem there is that they couldn't tell you're on a call or something because they couldn't see so people would open the doors and pop into offices constantly when people were like mid-meeting or something right Right. or 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 in it so we started learning and evolving so that we got the film just to eye height everywhere throughout we work in the middle and you'll notice that and and just a little bit so you can't look at eye contact we also started tracking how people use the space through apps and we learned that at a circular table, it, random people won't sit at a circular table only if you're having a meeting and speaking to each other, no really? matter how big or small the table. Yeah, it just started becoming a thing. Whereas a linear table with some kind of barrier in between, you and I'd be more likely to sit closer. And this was all about density and how you get people closer together. Sure. It's and a square footage thing, right? It's a square footage thing, right? Yeah. So we started learning what the what the appropriate desk size was there was so much effort we had custom desktops that we used and the power and data requirements we, we just kept honing in on every little detail and tightening it up and feeling it up and hardwood floors were, were a must because we liked the look but acoustics were terrible so we started putting acoustic panels in random areas in the ceilings and we started putting them on the walls below the desks and like started putting egg crates underneath desks we started just we did so many different experiential things and we just continued we evolved and iterated, evolved and iterated. And then we started pulling in, what, how could we build it faster, right? So we started prefabbing the glass. How, we, we had a couple of tech strategies using a software called Revit where we, where we custom built all these things that we learned, yeah. got built into our models and we could do drawing sets from schematic design to construction documents in three weeks time, which nobody built at this pace in the history of humanity. Yeah. And that's- that was- Nobody talks about that. And that documentary missed that too. But nobody built it at that space. So like, just to answer your question though, like those cool little vibes were all learned. Like some of the, some of the little details at the mill were unique to me and things that I wanted to add that were Delaware-esque. Sure. But, but 
we started learning and iterating on furniture and different things. It, it didn't just happen, right? Or we we're just good at the design phase. We just obsessively asked our clientele what they wanted and just kept getting better and better. That's you bring up a great point that there was no business plan for this that really existed. You guys had to, to come up with it. And what better way to come up with the perfect business than ask the people that are actually using it? Seems right. so simple, right. but I would imagine most businesses don't love asking their clients for, for as much feedback as you did. And then Absolutely. trying what they suggested. Absolutely. And then, you know, and then, and then another point of where I started jumping off is that in those client investigation things, we were looking at it from an architecture perspective, but I started getting feedback from small business owners of what they need outside of their space needs. Yeah. And the, the sort of concept of WeWork started to evolve and the documentary missed this. And I have some of the original pitch decks that we made to like Bill Rudin and Boston properties. And I was in all those meetings, which was bizarre to me. Right. You know, <laughs> right. Um, and I did these, I did all the presentations in Illustrator, but what if you had, it's, it's not just, we weren't trying to lease office space and memberships. If you're a small business owner, how do you take all these pain points away? What if we were doing their QuickBooks and handing their HR and handling all these pain points yeah. that small business owners had, like that I have to deal with on a daily basis that I don't want to deal with. Right. What if it was all encompassing, right? Your space needs, your, your, your coffee, your beer, your conference rooms, your QuickBooks. And what if you became the Walmart of business services, right? Right. And, that's kind of where it began to evolve. And that's where we work and I started to separate because they just, they would pitch that, but they weren't following through on those nuanced details. Sure. And I get it now, now that I own the mill, I, I've, you know, I don't have the scale that they were operating at, but I get why those things are hard to execute. For sure. But um, I wish they would have, and I think that they will someday. I think there's a yeah. new evolution we work. I think that once Adam's out of the picture, they'll start getting back to what they were trying to, trying to be. Yeah. That's amazing. So, you know, that whole background shapes everything that, you know, the, the, that you've sort of done and you've got over a hundred thousand square feet of office space now in, yeah. how, two in two locations. So how long into your first location did you say we need another one? More expand in the same location. And so we filled up in two weeks, we were fully occupied. So wow. talk about organization, like, and then we were already planning our second phase. So our first phase was like fifteen thousand square feet, uh, which from to, which is also crazy from a pro forma perspective. It did not work financially. You need scale for this to work really well. Okay, so we, we were just dipping our toes based on the size loan I can get, given that I, you know, wasn't very credit worthy back then. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> to be frank, that's a little inside baseball, but like that's yeah. the side. It was, that's what we built that, right? Sure. Um, that's reality. And I, and I really appreciate the early lenders who, who took a chance on us too, because it was like, trust me, it's going to be cool. Like how, how many bankers want to hear that? Yeah, trust right. Me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Forget about it, right? And I, I, I had to pitch and sell so hard. It was a uh, shout out to what is now known as True Access Capital, who took a chance on me. And then uh, Wisfis Bank, Ron Weingrad. I don't, he he went out on a limb and uh, and underwrote this thing where I don't think anybody else would have. Wow. So, so that, but then so then we leased up and then we were expanding after. That. Then the rest was history. It got a little bit easier each each time we kept expanding. Yeah. The next expansion was was almost doubled the size, more than doubled the size of us. Then we took out the whole floor of thirty thousand square feet and just kept going. These little like twenty thousand square foot iterations. That's amazing. And then we built well Concord, which is a little. Rich. Yeah, that's so that's 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 crazy that you yeah. within two weeks you were filled up. Yeah, it was wild. It was that kind of kept me going, right? That got, that gave me the confidence of like we're onto something here. Yeah, and uh, and not only that, the success of companies that were coming through the door, like we had this internet startup company that came through. We had Fair Square Financial, which built the Olive Card. We had Patrick Callahan and, and Compass Red. We we yep. just had. And these guys, it was so cool to have that energy around too. We kind of built this little community here in Wilmington. And it was, it was, and it, it's continued, like Patrick's moved on because he has, he's too big for us, right? Like, right. Then we, and then um, same thing with Fair Square Financial. They take a full floor in their own building now. They started off, I joke that their founder, Jerry Maguire, out of his office at Bank of America. <laughs> and then before we knew it, we were like, he was 
we were leasing him conference room space full time to fit his staff because he was outgrowing us that much. And Holy crap, that's cool amazing! To watch all that with that energy around and stuff, you you know you feel confident in yourself. Really yeah, exciting. for sure. That's a good thing for everyone to feed off of that that in, yeah. internally too. To see you know, hey, they started out here now they're leaving. You know, it's sort of like yeah. they need more space than we have. That's pretty great. And to see a CEO from the banking world come into our space and he was playing ping pong with like tattoo artists and this interior designers and things like that. And we were all getting down and drinking beers and hanging out together. It was, it's fascinating. Right? It's such a cool, that's the beautiful aspect of co-working that I, that I hope to create here. Yeah, for sure. So since we're, you, you bring up the beer thing, you got a little yeah. bit of support from one of my favorite breweries and, you know, yeah. Dogfish Head, which we, which you are drinking right now. So how'd that come to be? Well, um, as the story goes, so like Chris Buccini gave me Sam Caligioni's cell phone number, which was a mistake because I called him a bunch. And I think to a point, like I left voicemails and stuff, and I think I'm pretty sure it was irritating. And somebody, it's Christy from his team, I can't remember her last name, reached out and was like, you, you got to stop doing that kind of thing, but how can I help you? <laughs> right? It was, like, it was like one of those. And I spoke with him briefly, he probably doesn't remember it to, these day, to this day. It was the same kind of message. And, and I was like, hey, I really want to brand my pantry area, the Dogfish Head Pantry area, because we had Hagley coming in. We had all these local companies. The Barn Creative did our logo. It was all Delaware all the way. Yeah. And what could be more Delaware than Dogfish Head on draft? And I wanted to call it the Dogfish Head Pantry area. Right? Yeah. And I remember him saying, like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Like, and, and <laughs> I, I, they had reasons like liability or license. I, I can't remember what it was. Um. Because we didn't, it's not like we're, we're, we don't serve alcohol here. Like it's just a co working space. We have it on draft, but it's not, we're not a bar or anything. And so I basically got a hard no, but the day we opened, April 1st, five years ago, uh, a dogfish head keg showed up with a note from Sam and a huge sign that said, Off Center Ales for Off Center Entrepreneurs, this custom made metal sign. That's that, awesome. we, that we have hung up in our pantry area this day. And so like, I remember getting really emotional when that, I didn't realize what it was and I wasn't, I, you know, I was told no. Yeah. And uh, since then, like, I, I've never met Sam in person. I kind of don't want to, because I think that'll be, it would ruin it for me. Right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, and that fits so, so perfectly into, into the mill. Yeah. Yeah. And it just fit the vibe. And I, I still have that, I cherish that sign to this day. Yeah. The, note, the note that that was written it was cool that's all that's really cool the, you need those little those little you know again talk about people supporting what you do when you have those little things that happen it it, it gets you confident to go to the next phase right? yep for sure yeah <laughs> so i i'd mean, be interested i'd be i would be insane if i didn't ask you about the pandemic and the office space world got sort of decimated by the pandemic and i feel like everything has sort of shifted to, hey, maybe co-working is really all we need, right? So yeah. how has the pandemic, uh, you know, transformed the mill? Well, yeah, at first it was confusing, like, 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 like with everybody, right? And, and what's appropriate, what's not, like, how, how do we handle it? Do we let people come work out of here? It was just, it was a really hard time. After going through that, I feel like I've kind of taken my, taking enough lickings to like that. I've, I feel like I've earned the right to be called an entrepreneur and business owner now after all this chaos. Cause that's up until this point, it was full growth mode, expansion all the way. Yeah. I want to be in like five cities by now. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you get, you, <laughs> you get knocked down and you, you, it's a different type of ball game when you squeeze your financials down to make sure you're, you're open tomorrow. Right. Right. And, and the place emptied out is really depressing. So I, would, I came in every day throughout the pandemic cause it was a safe place to be cause there was nobody around. Nobody here. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But fortunately, our leasing didn't, our revenue didn't plummet like our actual, like people weren't showing up, but they still were keeping their offices. Um, so, so we got through it. So revenue wasn't terrible. We got through it. But what I'll say now, we did a couple of transition things where virtual offices and collecting mail and packages for people became more important than ever. Huh. So, so a lot of my staff just kind of transitioned to, to do a lot of mail handling for these tenants because they somebody had to do it. Yeah. And we were calling, and, and this is not totally like always kosher, but again, for health safety reasons, people really needed like checks from clients and things like that. So we would drive stuff to the people's houses just to offer that service. And wow, that's awesome. Again, we don't continue that because there's a lot of liability in that. But during those unconfusing times, sure, 
I think that we've got a lot of brand loyalty after how we handled that and handled no doubt helping people with packages and whatnot. And so we, we were weirdly like this package service for a little while, right? Yeah. Um, and then coming out of it now, a lot of people that were coming up on their, their leases that have been in the same space for, in, some, in one case, a decade, they, they're like, I don't know what we want to be. I don't know if we want to work like this. I don't know if we want to have like cube farms. Yeah. Um, so we have these larger companies that would never be interested in a space like the mill that want to be in the mill now. So I'm, we're renovating another floor as we speak. Wow. Um, we're going to, we're going to finance it. It should, we should be closing on our loan towards the end of the year. Um, but we're going to do a whole floor with like 2000, 3000 square foot suites. And there's going to be like a dozen of them that's that are bigger. That's not really what you think of as a co working size space. Sure. Yeah. But uh, there's just this huge, I'm, I'm all sold out of those size offices. It's these larger companies that want, two to three year leases and they don't want to pay any tenant improvement costs. They want a nice decked out space they can move into. Yeah. And then in two to three years, then maybe they'll build something when they understand what the world looks like. Right. With the hybrid working and everything. It also seems to me that, you know, you build a two thousand, two to 3000 square foot suite. That's super flexible in the event that things change again, where you could right. shorten them up again if you needed to. Correct. Correct. And I, and I think that the, I, my belief is that office space has always, it's been going through a transition. The pandemic just was the great accelerant on so many cultural and, and so, many office, so many different trends that they just yeah. sped up in my mind, right? So I think the office space world was already heading in this direction where people don't sign 10 year, 10 year term leases anymore. For right? sure. You just, we're such, we're such um, a book that I love called Funky Business. They talk about these, the, 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 where we're heading as a society where you have these startup and crash startup and crash type cultures and people even large companies like dupont doesn't know where they're going to be in 10 years now right you know, think about they were the picture of stability sure and, and 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 you look at the big guys like like amazon nowadays but they're ever evolving and ever changing so these long-term leases are just not appealing so i think there's more i think we're going to see heavy amenities like we do in residential space mm -hmm. for office spaces and I think that you're going to see the landlords like myself have to take on the sort of thinking through the way people want their office space. And I think that's why that time with WeWork is so relevant to what I do now is that I can kind of, it's more what humans want is not going to change as much, yeah. right? Maybe a little bit, but we were already heading that way. And I think that taking that stress away from a company to have to figure out themselves and putting it on the landlord to do is, is the future. Yeah. It's nicely into that future. It sure does. Yeah, that's yeah. that's awesome. So as, as we sort of wrap up here, I'm interested in what's what's next for you and for the mill. You know, what other ventures are you getting into, and wh where where do you see things moving forward? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, we have invested heavily, particularly during the pandemic, on a, a custom software for the mill um, that that is not ready to be launched yet. But that's something I spend a lot of time on um, for a couple of reasons during the pandemic. Uh, given my expertise and my weird background, I, I might be, I'm very well positioned to sort of consult other co-working companies. And I, and I really believe in this model. Sure. I'm sort of like the anti we work, we work guy now where I'm like <laughs> coaching, up, coaching up other people on how to do it. And I, yeah. just because I believe in it. Right. So, so the, we have had a handful of companies reach out for us to manage spaces for them, or they, they went under and, a, and a, the developer stuck with this, co-working space turned ready to go and nobody to manage it. So we're, we're, we're kind of becoming this operation solution with the software piece. And um, along with expanding locations for ourselves, we're, we're, we are very close. Depends on the deal in Pittsburgh right now. I've spent a lot of time there. That's great. Um, I think Pittsburgh is well positioned for co-working. There's not a lot in that city. Um, very underrated town in my, my opinion. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, then, and then with that, I, I really intended to, to i would like to do a play where we're buying office space ourselves and my development team and then uh the mill is operating and, and fitting it out yeah instead of just hoping for anchor tenants to show up right yeah so i think that that's kind of the next model next iteration of where, where we're going to head as a development company and as a co-working company that's great well Rob, this was awesome. I, I really enjoyed our, our conversation. This was fantastic. And if, you, if you'd like to know a little bit more about Rob and the mill, uh, head to his website at millspace.com. 
Um, if you would like to connect with me on the untapped app so we could we see all the beers that I review, my username is brcarney7. To learn more about how our firm helps business owners with their financial planning, visit riversedgeadvisors.com. And finally, to hear past episodes of the podcast, go to happy-half-hour.com. Now, we have to rate this beer. Now, I do have to grade this on a curve because of my overall distaste for pumpkin beer. I actually really like this. Very good. I would give this a three out of five. Okay. What do you say on the uh, costumes and karaoke? I'm going to do a four out of five. Hmm. And it's eight percent, so I can't do too many of these. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you need to Uber home if you uh, have yeah, yeah, more of those. It's definitely got a lot of flavor. It's good to kick off the night with. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Well, Rob, um, thank you so much. Uh, I really, really enjoy talking to you. Yeah, likewise. All likewise. right. Che- cheers. Take time. cheers. Thank you for listening to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur, sponsored by Rivers Edge Advisors. For more information on how Rivers Edge Advisors can help you, visit their website at riversedgeadvisors.com. If you'd like to connect with Brian Carney for business advice or just to share a beer, follow him on Instagram at riversedgeadvisors underscore LLC.